The New York Mets signed flamethrower Shintaro Fujinami on Friday, giving them yet another option for their bullpen. Is this now going to be a strength for the Mets moving forward? I'll break it all down on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Ficklestein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers who join today will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Well, we thought the New York Mets might finalize a deal with a relief pitcher on Friday, and they did. Jake Diekman. He got $4 million for the 2024 season, a vesting option for 2025 at $4 million as well. He has to pitch in 58 games to get that vesting option. I imagine that he will. So basically a two-year $8 million deal. Could have had Wandy Peralta for $16.5 million. I'll take Diekman for two years, $8 million with that option. Being vesting. So if he doesn't pitch well, it's only a one year, $4 million deal and he's off your books. But that's not why we're recording a podcast right now. It's because the Mets decided, you know what? Let's go on that another relief pitcher, which is shocking because Andy Martino told us the budget. It was 10 million. You got Adam Adovino for four and a half. You got Jake Diekman for four. That's eight and a half million. And they signed a guy for more than a million and a half. Maybe they were shopping in that market for three to four million dollar relievers. They got down the road with a couple of them. They said, you know what? Let's just bring in three. So they signed flamethrowing ready Shintaro Fujinami to a one-year $3.35 million deal that has $850,000 in incentives. Now, this is a very interesting gamble. This guy throws 103, or at least he touched that last year. He averaged over 98 miles per hour on his fastball. That is why the Mets are signing him. He has really good stuff. He's got that electric fastball. He's got a split finger and he's got a cutter and the cutter and the split finger both carried whiff rates over 37% last year. That shows you a plus pitch guys were swinging through it and his fastball had a whiff rate of 25.5%, which is really good for a fastball. The split got hit pretty hard 451 slug against it, but the other two pitches really weren't hit that hard, but his numbers are not very good in the big leagues. He came over from Japan last year with the Oakland Athletics. They thought, why not? We'll throw him in our rotation. We can give him that opportunity. It's not like they were really trying to win it last year. So, hey, they threw the guy in there, give him a chance. Did not work out for Fujinami. He made seven starts. He went 0-6. He gave up 28 earned runs in 17 and two-third innings pitched. He walked 12, struck out 14, hit three batters. His whip in his starts was 2.15. So, that's... Over two base runners allowed per inning. Not a good recipe to get outs. Then they convert him to a relief pitcher, eventually trade him to the Orioles. As a reliever, he pitched 61 and a third innings, and he had a 5.14 year rack. Better? Definitely not great. His whip did drop significantly, though, to 1.304. His strikeout per nine went from 7.1 to 10.1. So you saw the uptick in strikeouts you'd like. The walks, you want to see him get that under control. Command is a real issue with Fujinami. But again, this is basically just taking a flyer on upside. And I love it for the New York Mets. Why not? Get a guy that if everything breaks right, whew, imagine you can go, you know, 103 from Fujinami to 102 from Edwin Diaz late in the game. Maybe you split them up a little bit. You throw some Brooks Raley in between to, change up the looks and you go Fuji to Rayleigh to Diaz could be nasty, nasty stuff. And they also have minor league options in this deal. I went to Fangraphs; They're listing as three minor league options. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but there is an option that they can put them down in the minor league. So if Fujinami isn't pitching well in spring training, they can park them in Syracuse. They can they even keep them in extended spring training at their pitching lab, um, you know, which it is up and running, but 
to keep him in that pitching lab a little bit, work on him, get him where they want him to be. This is a, a ball of clay that you're trying to mold into a really good pitcher, and it's a worthwhile gamble. It's also a, a move that I think, uh, again, makes you, you know, see these conflicting viewpoints on this season. In some respects, they want to see the youth. This is about the long game here. That's also why you're signing pretty much everyone to one-year deals outside of, you know, some options like Sean and I having that that option for the second year. But, you know, for most of these signings, it's all one-year deals across the board. It's basically bringing guys in for this season and trying to find a team that's just going to maybe coincide and be really good. Who knows? But Fujinami is just this gamble where yeah, they didn't need to spend $3.35 million. And for Steve Cohen, was that like a $7 million deal with the tax? It might just be. But this is what he affords his front office to do with you know, his, paid, his pocketbook. And for Stearns, he's not taking advantage of it. He's not you know, going to Steve Cohen and say, hey, we absolutely need to get a DH in here. He said, all right, this is a guy that we can bring in that could be really good. And it's not a long-term investment. It's not going to kill us in the future. It's just a worthwhile gamble. Let's take a shot here. And instead of going out and signing the one reliever to be the set of man to Edwin Diaz, they get three guys who could fill that role and probably who will all fill that role at different points of the season. Adam Adovino is most likely to be the eighth inning guy, but there might be times where Jake Diekman is on for a month and Carlos Mendoza can go to him and leverage. Or who knows if Shintaro Fujinami comes through this pitching lab and is you know a perfected version of himself for a year as a relief pitcher, you know you have a six foot six dude that throws over a hundred a ton and can really just mow hitters down. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch Fuji. He's going to come into games and he's going to wow you. Whether um, you're in awe of how he's getting hit so hard, um, whether you're in awe of how he can't throw a strike. Or if you're instead in awe of the sheer velocity, the, the nastiness of his stuff and his ability to, to really dominate because he, he does have that in him. It's just a real question if he can tap into it with any form of regularity. But again, it's a fun risk to take. So I really like this signing. And now you look at this bullpen, it, it's complete. I think it's actually really good. So I want to go through where the Mets bullpen is right now in just a minute. First, though, Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl Sunday to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. Well, you like to bet on everything when it comes to the props, like you know the national anthem, how long is it going to be? Is it going to be heads or tails for the coin toss? Commercials, I know there's some, some props there. Whatever it is, you can do that at FanDuel, but also you can bet on the first you know, guy's going to score a touchdown in the game or who's just going to win the game overall. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers who join today will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. It is pretty remarkable what a couple of weeks can do to change your perception on uh, a team or, or a certain aspect of a team because you look back a few weeks, we were all really curious about this Mets bullpen. The only major league sign they had made was Jorge Lopez, and then it was this collection of minor league deals and split contracts where – you had to wonder, are the Mets just going to roll with all of these gambles and all of these risks and all these unproven guys? And they still brought in some risky players. Shintaro Fujinami is far from a sure thing. But in the span of a couple of weeks, they've added three relievers on MLB deals. And two of them, veterans who have been around a long time, who you know do provide a certain level of floor or at least a certain amount of long-term consistency where you feel pretty good about the fact that Adam Montevino and Jake Diekman are going to be integral pieces for this bullpen all year. They're not going to be on the taxi squad up and down. These are guys who are on major league contracts, who are major leaguers, 
who are going to be in that bullpen and who have you know, plenty uh, of capability left to be big contributors. Fujinami is more of that risky guy, but he's sort of the highest end risk they've made this offseason. He kind of fits in that same bucket as all those minor league signings. He's just getting paid $3.35 million. You know, if Kyle Crick is pitching significantly better than Shintaro Fujinami, he's going to be in that bullpen on opening day, and Fujinami's going to be making a lot of money to live in Syracuse. But what the Mets have been doing here is they've been not just taking a lot of shots at, at you know, finding the pieces to this bullpen, and they have been doing that, but it, it's it's more calculated than I feel like it's been in the past. I feel like in, in previous off-seasons, the Mets have just, you know, thrown a bunch against the wall and try to see, you know, what's going to ultimately stick. And in the last off-season, there was a lot of, you know, attention paid to adding relievers that had optionality, guys that could be in Syracuse and in the big leagues. And that's great if any of them are good, but they just weren't. Not to say that, you know, David Stearns is definitely, uh, you know, going to get all these right, and he's a better executive than Billy Epler, and his eye for talent is just so superior that there's no way this fails because it's relief pitching. There's always volatility. There's always risk. But it, it really does seem like there has been a concerted effort to find pitchers that fit the Mets mold that will work well at Jeremy Hefner, guys that have – you know, at least one elite pitch that they can throw in through their pitching lab. They can try to find an arsenal to work around it and hopefully craft some really good relief pitchers that can help out Edwin Diaz in that bullpen this year. And I look now at where the pen's at after making these three signings. They're deep. This is a really deep bullpen in all those minor league signings that we thought were going to have to fill you know, two, three spots in this pen, maybe even four spots in this pen. Guess what? They're all going to be in Syracuse, most likely. Anthony DeComo said 22 relief pitchers are going to be, you know, invited and heading to spring training for the Mets for, you know, seven, eight spots. If they carry a six-man rotation, or even, you know, a five-man rotation with one of those starters in the bullpen. Seven spots, and look at how many guys they have now: it's Edwin Diaz, Adam Adovino, Brooks Raley, and Jake Diekman. Two righties, two lefties that I feel pretty good about to be able to go out and be quality big leaguers all year and, and really help you through your season. Drew Smith, Jorge Lopez, two guys with good stuff who have had good seasons in the not too distant you know, past who can hopefully bounce back and be big contributors this year. Then you have Shintaro Fujinami, this crazy wild card. That's seven. Again, if the Mets have six starting pitchers on the opening day roster, you're set right there. Now, if Fuji doesn't make it, if somebody else gets hurt, there's a lot of guys in that collection of 22 relievers that will be fighting for one or two spots in that bullpen. And you know, when you look at that long list of guys that are going to be coming into camp, a lot of them will be able to stick in the minor leagues from the Mets to, to prove themselves and to be waiting to eventually be called on. And so I, I just believe that this team is going to be able to you know, filter in guys throughout the season that are going to be able to surprise you for a stretch. They're going to be able to give you, you know, two good appearances before they're sent down. I think guys are going to ascend that we didn't expect to. And you might find someone pitching in high leverage that you weren't counting on. And maybe it is Fujinami, or maybe it's one of these other signs they've made. Maybe it's Jorge Lopez. But I feel like the Mets have done a really nice job this offseason of giving themselves as many chances as possible to find the right combination of a of a bullpen that's going to be really able to move the needle for them. And with all of that, I'm starting to believe in this team a little bit. It's not that Shintaro Fujinami is the piece that had me, you know, suddenly putting my optimistic hat back on. Anyone who's been listening to the show for any length of time knows that I always try to skew optimistic. I'm never trying to just dwell in pessimism and say that the Mets don't have any hope, especially when we're in February. February and March are the months of hope for baseball, more than any others. So, yeah, this is where you talk yourself into some stuff. But I'm just very, you know, keen to what this front office has done because for such a long time on this show, I was advocating for the, the addition of David Stearns. And I am not going to be one of these, these fans who 
watches one off season is upset that the Mets didn't get some type of a frontline starter to pair with Kodai Senga or a big bat in that lineup and immediately is out on him before you even see a season under his leadership. If you were thrilled about the Stearns, you know, hiring when it happened, you should trust the process now. And that's where I'm at with this team. I trust the guy calling the shots. So if he believes in Shintaro Fujinami, sign me up. Sign me up to see what Fujinami can do because there is enough upside to dream on where he is a big piece. And if he's not, I believe that one of these other guys that has been signed this offseason will be able to impress and take on that role. And with all that said, like I just alluded to, I think this team can be a winner in 2024. And I want to explain why I still have that faith, which I touched on there, but we'll we'll kind of look at it from all angles in just a minute, where I believe this is a playoff team. Not because of Fujinami, because of how David Stearns is going about building a winner. We'll go through what that means in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Can the New York Mets win with this bullpen in 2024? I really do believe that they can. And again, it's not about one of these signings. It's the collective. I am just having more and more faith, especially now that all of those minor league signings are that. They are minor league signings. They're guys that represent depth throughout the season, not guys that are going to be counted on from the jump. With what is now in-house and you know, getting that massive impact of Edwin Diaz back in that pen, I think this is a team that, for one, is going to be able to weather the storm of a season more, to be able to cycle in fresh arms that have a chance to, to provide impact more frequently. So it's not just, oh, man, who are they going to grab out of that bullpen? It's all right. There, there, there's arms back there that you can trust beyond just the one or two guys. So I think that's a part of it. But also, I just believe they've taken so many you know, chances now on guys that could profile as that high leverage reliever that to set up Edwin Diaz, that one or two of them is bound to stick. And if two of them do, and Edwin is back to being the guy he was in 2022, I think they're going to end up with a group that can really hold down leads when you get into those late innings. And I think they have enough pitchers in this rotation that can at least give them five. So if you have some five and dive starters, but they hand off a lead to the bullpen, you have a bullpen that's deep enough to get you innings and one that's good enough down the stretch to close tight games. And you have a great defense behind them, which is another thing that the Mets did to help their run prevention. Yeah, I think that you can be one of those teams where they have, you know, the Pythagorean win loss uh, record, right? How many wins you should have in a season where the Mets might be a Pythagorean win team of, you know, 81 wins, you know, 500 team, but they've won 87 games. And I feel like David Stearns is the king of building those types of teams in Milwaukee. And imagine going from a franchise where you have to, in a year where the Brewers this season coming up here, were enough in the mix to sign a Reese Hoskins but also could not afford to hang on to Corbin Burns and risk losing him for nothing. So they just traded Corbin Burns to the Orioles. That was the mindset of the franchise that David Stearns used to run. It's having to always think about the future and always value assets in a certain way. So you come up in that school of thought, and now you're provided with more resources. And it doesn't mean you abandon that thought that you had before because it worked for you. So, yeah, the Mets could have gone out this offseason and they could have been the other end of that trade. And they could have traded for Corbin Burns. But David Stearns knows that that trade, just like the one where he made and, and sent Josh Hader out, the team that deals the player that's close to free agency is losing that trade long term. So the Mets, when they're not ready to win a World Series like the Orioles are, they're not going to trade for Corbin Burns as much as the fan base wants them to. I mean, sure. Could the Mets have, you know, called up the Brewers earlier this off season and said, Hey, you know, we want to give you, um, I'm trying to think of the comp to Joey Ortiz because Joey Ortiz as a prospect is a guy that's, you know, a higher probability, big league shortstop. So you know, not to say that he's 
right in line with Luis and Helicuna, but it, it's it's closer than I think people would would realize just based on name recognition. So I should say, you know, Luis and Helicuna, and, and we'll even say Mike Vassell instead of Christian Scott um, for the DL Hall piece, even though DL Hall is way better than than Vassell, or you know, in some respects, even Christian Scott. But the point is, for the Mets, if they were to this offseason to have gone out and traded for Gordon Burns. And they had to give up a guy that has starter potential for you know, that full control and a guy that could be a starting shortstop in the big leagues before the Mets, maybe a second baseman. For one year of Burns, it would be a net loss long-term. So as much as it would be great to see Burns and Sang on this rotation, and maybe you could you know, sign Burns when he got to free agency, instead it's a better decision for this franchise to take one-year gambles on the free agent market in both the bullpen and the rotation to, you know, beef up their defense, see what this year brings. And next year, when it's just a free agent signing, they can go after Corbin Burns. So it's being armed with resources that he can do things. David Stearns can, but still knowing the the short term and long in long term implications of every move he makes from having to work under those, you know, you know, confining um, you know, shackles that he was under with the Brewers to keep that in the forefront of your mind and to just make really good business decisions for for Steve Cohen's team now to prioritize winning and, and finding that combination that's going to work this year, but always keeping long-term in your head. So I look at this roster right now. Is it what it was last year on opening day? No. Do they have enough talent to, you know, find a competent and you know well above average offense throughout this season? Yes, I believe they do. Do they have enough arms in that bullpen to potentially have a great pen throughout this season? When you have a closer like Edwin Diaz and you have enough high leverage potential options and you have a lot of depth, I do believe there is a pathway to a great bullpen. Now, I don't think there's a pathway to a great starting rotation. But is there one to a good enough starting rotation with plenty of depth and a lot of guys that could step up throughout this year? I do believe they have that. And I'm excited to watch this team play baseball in 2024. I really am. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked On Mets for uh, this week on Locked On Mets. Unless David Stearns gets crazy, wants to add another reliever, I'll be all for it. I'll be coming on for another podcast, but I wouldn't expect it. I think this is probably the last move of the offseason, um, unless a surprise happens. But that's going to be all again uh, for the show, and I'll be back on Monday previewing more of uh, you know the players on this roster as we get ready for the upcoming season. So make sure you, if you're listening on the audio side, follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Trying to get to 8,000 subs by opening day. So appreciate all of you. Hit that subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. And now. Why don't you head over to Locked On Sports Today, the first ever 24-7 streaming channel covering everything in the world of sports with our local experts from each team, our league-wide experts from each league. Follow Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.